Testing is important. No one, and I repeat, no one doubts that anymore, except people working with Kubernetes resources. Automated tests are a norm and test-driven development is widely accepted. We do not question that anymore when working with code of our applications. Yet, the same is not necessarily true for other types of code. Let's take Kubernetes as an example. You're writing manifests in some form or another. It does not matter whether that's pure Kubernetes YAML, Helm templates, customized overlays, YTT, JSONnet, or Q, which by the way, is my current favorite. How do we write manifests is not that important. What does matter is that we are not testing them. Now, you might say that automated testing of Kubernetes manifests is not important. How wrong can we be when we define, let's say, a Kubernetes deployment or a service or whatever else we are defining? Well, as a matter of fact, we can be very, very wrong. You see, it's not only what we write, but it's what Kubernetes makes out of it. When we define a deployment and apply it to a cluster, Kubernetes creates a replica set, which creates pods, which attach volumes and secrets. There is much more going on than a simple deployment, and we do not know whether all that works as intended. Or to be more precise, we might not know until it's too late to know. If you work with custom resources, things get even more complicated. I, for example, tend to create many cross-plane composite definitions, which are instantiated through claims, which create compositions, which create a number of managed resources and or other compositions. A lot is going on inside Kubernetes clusters and I got sick of wasting my time testing all the combinations manually or finding out about bugs after they reach production. And if all that is not enough, there is constant fear of refactoring. I found myself not wanting to improve my manifests nor to change them by adding additional features. Every change is a risk and I had no way to deduce whether a change will go smoothly or it will result in a disaster. Here's an example. I had my manifest written in pure YAML. One specific example has almost 2000 lines of YAML. Naturally, it's hard to manage all that, especially since there is a lot of repetition, there are no value replacements, and so on and so forth. You know the drill. Logically, I wanted to rewrite all that into something else. That could be Helm, CDK, YTT, JSONnet, or Q. I chose Q, but that's beside the point, since the story would be exactly the same if I chose something else. I have something that I want to refactor. That something is big. And there is no decent way how I could ensure that the new outcome is the same as the old. I cannot refactor because I'm afraid. And I'm afraid because I cannot do it with confidence. I need tests to tell me that something works correctly. Anyone, anyone working with Node.js, Go, Java or any other programming language will say the same. There is no confidence without tests and without confidence we cannot progress easily. We cannot add new features because we do not know how will they affect the rest of the system and we cannot refactor because we cannot confirm that before and after are the same. Anyways, my intention is not to give you the lecture about testing but to say that well-established practices are equally valid no matter which language we use to write something that can be interpreted by machines. Hence, there is no good reason not to test Kubernetes manifests. If we test Go and Java and shell scripts and anything else interpreted by machines, we should test Kubernetes manifests as well. We know the process and we know what is the expected outcome. The only thing missing is a testing framework. Now, to be fair, there is not much available, but that's not an excuse to give up. One is enough. And I found it. And I used it for a while. And now I want to share it with you. The tool in question is called Kotl, Kotl, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I'll call it Kotl and you should know that it is short for the Kubernetes testing tool. 
So let's explore unit testing applied to Kubernetes manifests using CATL. Now, before we dive into CATL, let me say right away that I will demonstrate how it works using my stuff and that you should not think that it is limited to that specific use case. It does not matter whether you're writing typical Kubernetes resources like deployment services or ingresses, or you're writing third-party custom resources like those for Argo CD, Isti, or Knative, or you're writing custom resource definitions and controllers using the Kubernetes operators pattern or Kubevela open application model, or as is in my case, cross-plane compositions. It does not matter which type of Kubernetes resources you're defining, the principles and the logic are the same. With that out of the way, let me show you an example of a test run I'm performing. I will start by creating a new Kubernetes cluster using Kind. Now, you might be wondering, why am I using Kind instead of something like Minikube, Branch Desktop, Micro Kates, or anything else? If you're watching this channel, you might know that I prefer Branch Desktop. But in this case, I believe that Kind is the best choice for a single reason. It's just as easy to create is to destroy a cluster. With Docker Desktop and Rancher Desktop, I would need to deal with a graphical user interface to reset them after my tests, while Minikube is significantly slower and MicroKates is, well, it does not matter. I just created a cluster with Kind and you can use any Kubernetes cluster you want. By the way, I have a video about Kind over there, so go and check it out if you're new to it. Now comes the important part, kubectl, cuttle, please test stuff defined in the tests directory. Now, in my specific case, the first run of the tests takes a bit longer since I need quite a few things set up in my cluster. A lot is going on here, so let's fast forward to the end and go through the output. First, it installed Crossplane through the Helm chart. Then I installed AWS provider, which brings us a couple of hundred CRDs and a few controllers. Further on, I did the same for the Sivo, Kubernetes, and Helm providers, my composite definitions, and the composition itself. Finally, I had to ensure that everything is up and running before I start running the tests themselves. Hence, I instructed it to wait until specific resources are ready. Now, that was me. I have tests for my crossplane compositions. Don't worry if you're not familiar with crossplane, since you would probably do something similar with whatever you're doing, and that is essentially install whatever you need and wait until it's ready. In other words, whenever I say crossplane or AWS or whatever I say, you replace it with uh, deployment or service and or your own CRDs and controllers, Knative Istio, whatever you're working with. And now we're coming to the important part. Cuttle started running tests, which in my case are split into AWS and Sivo directories. The first step is to create temporary randomly named namespace. Then it runs optional setup steps like, in my case, o-install. Those are meant to enable us to run whatever is required for a specific set of tests. Finally, there are assets themselves, which as with any other type of tests, are what really, really matters. Asserts are a way to validate whether the desired state is the same as the actual state, or to put it in other words, whether what something is, is the same as what we want it to be. At the very end, we can see the failures in form of a diff of the runtime resource and the one I specified in tests. The lines with the plus sign are those that exist in the resource running in the cluster, but not in the assert I defined. Those are not necessarily issues, since I did not specify every single line, but only those that I believe are worth validating. The key is in the lines with the minus sign. Those are the lines of the desired manifest that were not found in the actual resource. In this case, we can see that I expected the instance type to be set to T4 small, while the actual resource had it set to T3 small. That is the part that failed. That is the difference between what I expected something to be and what that something is. At the very end, we can see that the tests associated with the group I named Sivo passed, while those named AWS failed miserably. Now, since I expect those tests to be executed not only manually, 
as I just run them, but also through some sort of CI CD pipelines, I need to make sure that the exit code is correct. When the test pass, the exit code should be zero. And when they fail, the exit code should be any positive number, probably one. That's what your, your favorite pipelines tool expects. So let's see the exit code of the last command by executing echo dollar sign question mark. It is one. So it's clear that at least one test failed. Now that we saw it in action, let me show you what I did to make all that happen. Now that we saw Cuttle in action, let's see how I defined the tests and the setup steps. Everything is in the tests directory. Inside it, I split tests into two categories, each represented as a separate directory or to be more precise, subdirectory. Inside the AWS subdirectory are files named as a sequence. Cutler will first execute those with names starting with 00 or 00, move to 01 and so on and so forth. Now, there are generally two types of definitions. Those named as assert are, as the name would suggest, test asserts. Those are the tests themselves. Everything else can be categorized as setup steps. For example, OO install is a setup for OO asset. So let's take a look at it. This is a Kubernetes manifest as any other. I want to test whether my crossplane composition works as expected. And to do that, I'm creating a claim. Don't worry if you're not familiar with crossplane. What matters is that I'm creating a Kubernetes resource that I want to test. Now, if you take a look at OO asset, we can see that it's also a Kubernetes manifest, but it serves a very different purpose. Over there, I'm validating not only that what I deployed through OO install is what is running in the cluster, but also that some additional fields were added by Kubernetes itself at runtime. Specifically, I'm testing that the resource ref fields are what they should be. Now, just as a Kubernetes deployment creates a replica set, crossplane claims create compositions, so I should test that as well, right? That's what I defined in O1 assert. There's probably no need to go into details. What matters is that I'm testing not only that the resources I'm creating are correct, but also that the child resources spawn up from those are correct as well. Then there is O2 assert that goes even further. Just as a replica set created uh, through a deployment creates pods, crossplane compositions created through claims create managed resources. So in O2 assert, I defined what all those resources are. Now, let's say that I want to update a resource in the cluster and test that the update went well. That's what I did in O3 update file. What I have there is almost the same as the claim I defined in O install, but this time with a different value for the node size and min node, node, not node, node count fields. Then there is O3 assert, which validates that the update works as expected. Remember the claim creates a composition which creates managed resources. And right now I'm interested only in one of those. So I'm asserting only that the node group is correct. Specifically, I'm interested whether the instance type will be changed to T4 small and that desired size and mean size will be set to five. The rest of the asset is the same as what I had before. Now, if you do remember the output produced by running the test, you will know that the O3 asset failed or to be more specific, that it found that the instance type is T3 small instead of T4 small. I discovered what needs to be fixed. That's what I did. The last piece of the puzzle is the cuttle test file. That's where everything is tied together. It is a test suite and the tests together with the setup steps specific to steps are located in the directory specified in the test dears field. Further on, I have the command section that can contain, that does contain a number of commands that will be executed before the tests themselves. I'm using them to install crossplane as a Helm chart, deploy some providers and my composition and wait until everything is ready. Now, to be clear, there are quite a few other ways how I could accomplish the same result. Cuttle allows me to specify fields like uh, manifest dears, artifacts dear, uh, and CRD dear fields, 
but I feel that they're not needed. The command section allows me to specify the same setup I would use if I would run the same setup manually without cuttle. Further on, we have timeout, which probably does not need any explanation. You know what it is, right? And finally, there are a few options I do not use, at least when working manually, but I feel that others might benefit from. Hence, I have them commented as a reminder. Start kind will start a kind cluster, which is unless a cluster, skip cluster delete is set to true, deleted after the tests are done. I prefer not to delete the cluster so that I do not waste time creating it and setting up everything more than once. You see, I use Cuttle for unit testing and that means that I write asserts, see them fail, make changes to my manifest and see them pass. That process is repeated over and over and over and over again in rapid iterations so I don't want to lose more time than necessary. I could specify skip cluster delete, but I feel that uh, if I let Cuttle create a cluster, I will forget to delete it manually later on. Now, if you do let Cuttle create clusters for you, you probably want to set kind node cache to true so that you don't waste time downloading images over and over and over again. Finally, there is skip delete option. When left to the default value of false, Cuttle will delete all the resources it created from manifests in the test dirs. I don't want to do that since that might lead to unexpected results. I prefer deploying test-specific setup every single time. There are quite a few other options we could use inside test suite and there are other types of configs like test step and test assert. We can also use collectors to collect certain information and the commands have quite a few options that I did not show over here. I will not go into those now. Check the docs, check the documentation. Now, imagine that I fixed the issue detected through tests. What would I do next? Well, run the tests again by executing kubectl, cuttle, test, tests. You'll notice that everything is faster now since there is no need to create a cluster, install crossplane, and so on and so forth. All I have to do now is wait. Actually, I would not wait, but continue working on my manifests and come back to the tests later on just before I run them again. But in this case, I'm simulating this being the last run before I retire for the day. So waiting and there we go. All the tests passed and I'm done working for today. The only thing left for me to do is actually to delete the cluster. When I said that I'm finished for the day, I lied. There is one, one, one more step missing before I can retire. I need to push my changes to Git. Given that I believe that everything I do manually while developing should be run as a result of pushing changes to Git on top of whichever other tasks uh, I normally run uh, and I don't necessarily run manually, it's natural that to assume that cuttle tests are a part of my release pipelines. That might have sounded confusing anyways. What I'm trying to say is that those cuttle tests are in my pipelines. That's where they should be. So let's take a look at, in this case, GitHub Actions I'm using in this repository. Some steps are not important for this story, like for example, at the very beginning where I'm setting up Timoni and using it to build my manifest written in queue. If you're interested in Timoni, which is awesome, uh, you should uh, check that video, that video over there. What matters for this story is the run test section, which starts with an ugly set of commands that download and set up crew which is Kubernetes, uh, or not Kubernetes, kubectl plugin manager. And then I install Cuttle plugin and crossplane helm chart. And finally, I'm running Cuttle tests. Now you will notice that I'm uh, using some additional arguments over here. Unlike working locally, when working in pipelines, I find it easier to tell Cuttle to create a kind cluster through the start kind flag. Since each pipeline run is in a separate VM, there is no need to wait for Cuttle to delete the manifest and namespaces, so I'm disabling that with the skip delete flag. Similarly, there is no need to delete the kind cluster either, so I'm disabling that as well with the skip cluster delete flag. Finally, VMs provided by GitHub Actions tend to be relatively small and underpowered. That might result in more time required for things to settle, so I'm increasing the timeout to two minutes. 
That's it. Every time I push changes to this repo, the tests will run and if they fail, the pipeline will fail as well. Otherwise, a new release of my crossplane composition will be created and published. There's one, one more thing I would like to discuss before we move into my favorite section, which is pros and cons. Typically, I'd like building deployment and testing to be executed automatically every time I make changes to the source code, and I would like that to be fully automated. That way, I do not need to waste time on running a bunch of commands every time I write a few lines of code. In other circumstances, I would use something like Octeto, my current favorite, or DevSpace, or Tilt, or Scaffold, or something similar. You should watch those videos if you're not familiar with those tools. All those are great in their own way for streamlining development of applications running in Kubernetes, but none, none of them serve the same purpose uh, in this context. They all assume that I'm building images, pushing them to register, synchronizing code into a container, or some other similar task related to writing code of an app. But that's not what I'm doing here. All I need is a tool that will execute a few commands, among others, kubectl cuttle, whenever I change one of my manifests. I'll need to find something else for that, and that's annoying. I hate when I cannot use any of the tools I know to accomplish something, but none of those work for me in this context. Now, let's move into my favorite part of the video. Let's talk about pros and cons. Let's go through pros and cons first and then make a conclusion. And we'll start with bad things, with cons. Cuttle is not very extensive. I found quite a few things missing. I won't go through all those now, but say that one that I miss the most is the ability to run tests whenever a file system changes, or to be more precise, whenever I make changes to my manifest. There are tools that do those things, but none that I know fits well into the Cuttle workflow. So I feel that Cuttle should have that built in. That's not a big thing though. The second one will be more important one. And the last con is a very serious one. So bear with me. The test output is not very user-friendly. It is often hard to deduce what exactly failed given that there are no clear clues as to what to look at. You might end up spending more time figuring out what failed than fixing the issue itself. And now comes the big one. The project is almost dead. If you look at the releases, you will see that at the time of this recording, which is September 2023, the last release was made in January. That's nine months or eight or nine months ago. That almost full year passed without a single release. If you look at commits, there were only a few, mostly upgrades of dependencies. As for pros, I have only two. Cuttle is simple. It's easy to learn and use. It does not try to do too much, and what it does, it does decently well. That something is finding differences between the desired and the actual state. Just as with cons, pros are listed in the order from uh, that might be important to this really matters. So the second one, the second pro is the important one. Are you ready? Cuttle is the best tool as far as I'm aware for testing Kubernetes manifests. And that's a very important thing. Now, the important thing is also to explain why I think it is the best. Here it goes. Cuttle is the best tool in its category because it is the only tool in its category. I might be wrong, but that's the only one that is focused on testing Kubernetes manifests. Now, I might be wrong. You might know of another. And if that's the case, please let me know in the comments. I would really, really like to try it out. All in all, Cuttle is not a great tool, but it's the best we have. Many of the shortcomings might not matter. It does not do much, but we might not need it to do much. The output is not great, but one gets used to it. It's mostly abandoned, but it might not need to be maintained given its simplicity. Still, even if you say, I will not use it because of this or that, I must repeat one more time that it is the only tool in that category. Hence, it is the best one we have. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.